Okay, good afternoon, everybody, um, and a very warm welcome to today's webinar. Thank you. It's the last week of term. I'm delighted that some of you have taken that time to um, spend uh, hopefully only 40 min minutes with us this afternoon. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce myself, and then I'm going to uh, get Paul to introduce himself, and then we'll um, we'll get going. So my name is Claire Buckler. I recognise a few people um, here today, so hi. I am Director of Learning Commons here at DHSB, which mainly involves um, supporting students and staff with digital skills and our, um, our kind of move towards a Google serverless school. Um, I also teach computer science. Um, I teach it to A-level. I've been teaching computer science for about six or seven years and taught ICT before that, so around 16 years. I was at South Dartmoor, which is a large comprehensive school um, in Ashburton as head of department before moving here uh, three years ago. So. If I just get Paul to say hi and introduce himself before we move on. Hi everyone, um, my name is Paul Scott. I'm the head of computer science here at Devonport High School for Boys. Uh, this is my first year at the school. Um, I have been teaching for 18 years. Uh, the last six or seven years has been computer science. Before that was ICT, similar to Claire. And I taught at another school, Plymouth, another boys school. Um, I've been head of department for about 15 years over that time and I really have kind of taken to the way Google can be used in the classroom because it's all very new um, and exciting. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about that now. Thanks, Paul. Um, before I start, I, I just wanted to say a few things, really. I think it's this is a different webinar for me because we've got an awful lot of experience with technology on board. Um, and so I just wanted to say that this isn't really us telling you how it should be done. This isn't sort of saying this is the only way to do it. This is just us sharing really how we have moved, um, both Paul and I, from uh, Microsoft PC-based schools to a different environment. And it's something that's really worked for us. And there's been an awful lot of positives and benefits um, moving to Chrome. And we really wanted to share that, particularly in some of the misconceptions that we get sort of day in and day out about what you can and cannot do with, with Chromebooks. Um, so I'm really excited that we've got a lot of expertise with us. So if you want to add something, then please do chip in. If I could ask you to do that via the um, chat facility, though, that would be fantastic. OK, so before we move on, just a little bit of housekeeping um, from me. We are recording the um, meeting, so it's really helpful if your microphones could be muted just so that we can get that sound quality. Um, there's no requirement for you to be here, so if you want to have your cameras on or off, that's completely up to you. If you have any questions throughout our presentations, then please put them into the chat facility. It's, it means that we can all see them, and it means that I have a record of them if I can't answer them um, in the next 40 minutes or so. If you don't have the chat facility available to you, um, I'm pretty sure it is available to anyone that isn't enterprise on, on Meet, but if you don't, then just email claire.buckler at dhsb.org um, and I'll be able to get back to you. And finally, this session is part of our role as an ed tech demonstrator school. So we're helping schools and, and colleagues with support for remote education. And it's funded by the DfE, DfE as part of its Get Help with Technology a technology initiative. So if you could fill in the form that was sent out by our um, admin, that would be really helpful for us. Right. So just a little bit about of our, our journey, really, to where we have come from. Now, Paul and I are very new to this journey, but I just want to talk you back to 2013 at DHSB, where we introduced our digital leader scheme, um, where we have student helpers come in and help run our tech help desk. In 2014, um, that was when the decision was made to move to Google Apps for Education. And that was used to be a, a frog for the VLE. So 2014, the school moved to, to Google. In 2015, um, we were approached by, by Google to be one of the first in the southwest of what they call their reference schools. And that was because of the amount of people and students and teachers that we had that were using their classroom and other Google Apps for education. At that point, um, quite a large majority of the teachers at the school were taking their Google Level 1 educator certificate as well. 
2015, uh, the school decided to take their learning commons, uh, sorry, their library and turn it into a learning commons. So whilst we do have lots of books, the space has become a much more flexible space. And at that point, we bought Chromebooks in so that we have bean bags and we have Chromebooks to lend out to the boys. They can also be lent out into classrooms. Um, and they replaced iPads, which was what we had at the time. And the director of learning commons role was created so that was my role it wasn't me in 2015 and then fast forward to um, when i joined so that was 2019 um that's when we started realizing that the chromebooks really to go where we wanted with them being one-to-one -one would be a better model so we rolled out our one-to-one -one scheme and that was for years seven eight and nine um initially and then years 10 through to 13 could opt in if they wanted to it's a parent paid for scheme. So the parents pay um, a certain amount of money every month, um, which includes warranty and uh, insurance for them, um, for, their, for their students to have um, a Chromebook. It's phenomenally popular. So I think it's around 85 to 90% um, take up for year seven, eight and nine. Quite a few year 10, um, 12 and 13, we've had quite a few students opt in, but we also run a um, BYOD policy in year 13 so uh, sorry 12 and 13 but it's worth noting actually that quite a lot of those students that have opted to bring their own device in bring a Chromebook anyway as well as having the one-to-one -one scheme we have a huge amount of Chromebooks that we just have each department has a set the learning commons has two sets of 30 so no student is without a Chromebook if they're needed in lessons, whether it's their own or one that the school gives them. And currently we provide our pupil premium students with the same Chromebook. So we buy that for them. So our one to one um, currently is the Lenovo 500e. It's a flip Chromebook. It has a um, stylus. The stylus was really important when we asked our um, teachers because the maths and science teachers and the art department were really keen on, on using the kind of notebook technology. So it's a Lenovo 500e. Like I say, we provide those for our pupil premium and then they're the ones that the, the parents buy in for students. In terms of what we have as a school, um, the Lenovo 300e, the Lenovo 100e um, as well. And then we have some kind of uh, HP, sort of a bit cheaper ones that we have just as spares to loan out to students if they break them. This year um, has been really exciting. We've moved, we are underway with moving from SCOMIS, from SIMS, um, which we, <laughs> we've had, you know, we've had our issues with. We do run it with Chromebooks. We access it via a Microsoft RDP. Um, it generally works well. It's, that's not the problem we're having. We just feel that SIMS isn't really where we want to be as a school. So we're moving to a completely cloud-based system, which is called Bromcom. So that at the moment is, is underway. And very excitingly, we've kind of got rid of our, our last legacy IT suite. So we teach computer science currently, and, and Paul will let me know if I'm wrong on this, but currently um, three year 11 classes, three year 10 classes, three year nine classes, and our sixth form completely via Chromebooks. Um, our move to serverless, though, will be hopefully next year, but we still have our printing and our catering services to, to move up into the cloud. Right, so first up is Paul, and he's going to go through this as a head of department perspective. Paul, can you um, present? Yep, there we go, there we go. <clears throat> okay, hi everyone. Um, so as Claire said, I moved from um, a Windows school, um, and we moved to this school, which is obviously all Chrome-based. It, it was a bit of a, a leap. Um, and quite a learning curve for me because I was so used to just being able to use uh, Google products on a Windows machine whilst also using all the other apps. So it was a bit of a change, but um, it one term in and I've managed to adjust very quickly, which has been great, thanks to Claire and Jan in the department, which has been good. Um, so as our department stands, we're currently in a department or a faculty called the Enterprise Faculty, and within there we have computer science, business and economics. Uh, there are three computer science specialists and the three of us, Claire, myself and Jan, um, all work together to try and make sure the students are getting as an enriching experience as possible. So we 
show them how to use Google um, to be productive, to work effectively, to work collaboratively. Um, and we use G Suite, therefore, for everything. Uh, and it really helps us with our resources, helps us with sharing, helps us with adapting um, for different reasons. Um, we're all, the three of us are all Google educators, uh, level one and two. And the other teachers in the department have also done their um, level ones, which is brilliant. Um, We've been using Google Meet, and what we found with Google Meet, as, as we are now, um, is that it makes you more efficient. So even our department meetings, um, instead of being all around the school, um, are just much more efficient now, which is great. Uh, we've done some training recently on uh, Google Applied Digital Skills, which we're going to introduce next year uh, from February half term onwards, where we're going to try and meet some of the Gatsby benchmarks in the department as well. So that's kind of where we are. Okay, so the curriculum as it stands, it's a little bit different. I came from a school where they had quite very discrete computer science, which was much, um, much more skill building from day one. Whereas here, uh, Key Stage 3 is year 7 and 8, and they do a course called Enterprise, which is very business and computing combined. Uh, it works well, um, and the students get quite a lot from it because it gives it a really good context whilst giving them the same sort of skills. Uh, that then leads into their options at the end of year eight. So they can do the foundation year, which is all skill building, making sure they can code, making sure they can plan um, before moving on to the GCSE proper in year 10, where we do the, the OCR J277, and then on to the A level, which obviously has more complex coding, which Claire will talk about in just a minute. So the first thing I did when I joined is I started to map a brand new curriculum across the whole year. Um, to make sure that all the resources were pulled together and people were working together um, in terms of sharing those resources. The non-specialists and the specialists were able to then be more confident that what they were delivering was the same standard. Um, so we start to map that across the year and we'll continue to do so as we go. Okay, so you probably have used Google Forms at some point. Um, we've been using them an awful lot more because we've, we've tried to build in a lot more assessment uh, given the current situation with, with COVID. Um, and we had to find a way that was fair and allowed for blended learning for students to do their tests at home and all kinds of different things. So we used Google Forms and we found that as we started to create our own um, assessments, we could make them more rigorous. We could lock them down for just Chromebooks so that they can't do money other devices. Uh, we can track if they reopened it or closed it. Um, it's self-marking, which is really good for instant feedback. And also you can give um, really detailed feedback for students in the box, which means that they get quite a lot of impact from that. It's all individualized, so that's what we want. Um, this was one that I did with year 11 today, for example. They're, they're coming up to their um, end of term, so they've just had their test today on um, some gaps and misconceptions that we found from their recent mock exam, and it allowed them to check what they had learned and find any more gaps or any, any small uh, misconceptions that are still there um, to make sure they're closed before the next assessment. It gives you a good overview of the class. You can work out um, where there are major issues or where there are lots of positives, which was uh, a much improved test this round. Um, right, the other thing we do in the department is called electronic exercise books. We were trying to find in September um, a solution to having paper books because there was lots of concern about having to leave them for 72 hours, any kind of um, transmission of COVID, and uh, we had to find a way around it, especially if there were students who were working at home or um, elsewhere in the school. So we created electronic exercise books, and essentially they're Google Slides that have been um, created with a template to make sure they look like a real book. Students... Uh, preferred the look of it. They liked the fact that it looked like a book and they could relate that to their other subjects. And what we, they, the, what we later found was we could also um, change the paper color. So students with um, dyslexia who have to read on different color paper, you could just change it instantly for them and it was all very personalized for them. They can change the fonts, they can zoom in, it's, it, you can embed videos. It was really powerful and it turned into something much bigger than we thought it was going to be, um, which has worked really well for us. It's also got a built-in plagiarism checker, which is great to make sure they're not copying and pasting off the internet, which is always good. Um, they look like normal exercise books, so they quite like the fact that they could relate to them, as I said. So there's lots of different colors, depending on what subject they're in. 
Um, you can have different types of paper on the pages, graph paper, line paper, uh, square paper, and so on. So it made it really feel like something they could take pride in, and it was all in one document, so it could be checked live on Google uh, Classroom whenever you wanted to. You could give feedback whenever you want. They could tag you in it in a comment to ask you for help um, or to check a piece of work. It made it a much more collaborative um, piece of work, which was which was great. And it's, it means it can be marked more often. Um, and as you'll see in a minute, it takes less time to mark, which is good. So the marking bit was, was the scary part, because we, we kind of looked at it and thought, actually, there's no books anywhere. So how do we know what's getting done? And it was important. We had a way of, of monitoring what was happening in the department. So we worked on um, having kind of a book trawl type account that we could then look at other people in the department, see how their, their marketing's going and see if there's anything, any ideas we could pull from that. We looked at the use of rubrics and two people in the enterprise faculty, um, Dan and Gemma, did a fantastic um, presentation about how a rubric can be used to help students um, scaffold how they can improve their work. And the feedback was so useful to them and it could be marked in no time at all so a whole class um, could be marked in about 30 minutes so it made a huge difference uh, the other aspect we found was that with electronic exercise books in, in google slides was that you could just talk and it would type for you so you ended up with typed uh, marking that you have just talked to your laptop and it's done it for you so it saved an awful lot of time and made it very personal um, so you see at the bottom in the speaker notes that's where you would click and then you just go to voice typing and and talk away and it would just type for you so it was really quite useful and it really helped the students get that feedback in a really timely fashion okay and you can see on this one we embedded a video there where, where the student was struggling slightly with concepts and you can just insert videos to support them uh, and that was really useful for them and of course the best thing with Google is that you can collaborate and you can share your work with everyone and you can control what they can and can't do. And that really helps with um, kind of working as a team without moving around the classroom. It stops that COVID spread and, and kept it very digital, which was um, what we were trying to work towards. Paul, can I just um, stop you? I had a question. Um, there's a question about the electronic exercise um, book that we have in the uh, department. It says, do you still use assignments or set them via the ebook? So there are two two things. We, we set assignments when we need to um, have a piece of work that will be assessed and, and graded. So they know that when they're doing an assignment, that's what that's being used for. Whereas the exercise book is just keeping a log of their work in one place. And it, it's kind of a, an e-portfolio, essentially, that allows them to show what they can and can't do, which is... Uh, so we used both of them, but we found this was a really neat way to keep it all in one place. Okay. Right. Okay, Claire, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, Eagle-eyed amongst you will notice on the webinar that I've actually changed location, um, and that's because Google's downtime yesterday meant that um, my part of the webinar didn't record, so I'm just recording this section again. Um, so I wanted to talk about coding on a Chromebook. Um, I think one of the biggest misconceptions about the devices is that they're not powerful and they can't do this and they can't do that and they're, they're glorified web browsers. When actually that's kind of the opposite of um, what I found with Chromebooks. So I'm going to talk you through some of the things that I found successful. And this is a rehash of um, a presentation I gave for Google Education at BET last, uh, no, this year, sorry, when, when we were allowed to go to BET. So... I came from a Microsoft school, 16 years working um, with desktop PCs um, and locally installed software. And when I took the job on at Devonport High School for Boys, I picked up four hours of um, A-level teaching and I needed to teach the uh, programming project. And, and obviously that was fine. I was an experienced A-level teacher. Um, but then I found out that it would be on Chromebooks. And, you know, I had a small panic at that point. I didn't really know how to use a Chromebook. And whilst I'd been really familiar with the Google environment, we'd had Classroom, um, I didn't really know what you could and couldn't do. So this presentation really is about the things that I've discovered and, and found out and that you may find useful in your setting. So Linux um, is now available on the majority of Chromebooks. So 
you can turn it on. You go into settings and the settings here, Linux beta, just turn it on. And then you've got a fully, fully fledged terminal and container support for Linux. What this means is, is if the device is one-to-one, -one, and I appreciate that not everyone has this um, system, but if the device is one-to-one -one and the student has one Chromebook that they use all the time, it's their Chromebook, then this opens up an awful lot of opportunities for them to be able to install software onto their Chromebook. On the presentation, by the way, this supported links here will take you through to Chromebooks that actually um, allow Linux on, but even our most basic 100Es uh, the Lenovo's will allow you to have this Linux container support. What that does is it means that you don't necessarily always have to um, accept web-based solutions. You can have locally installed software. And so here I've got some examples that um, sometimes I use and, and actually sometimes I prefer a, a, a web-based app. You've got GIMP, which is very much like Photoshop. It's excellent it's very detailed it's everything that you would get out of photoshop and that's locally installed it's very easy to install that um when you install anything on google there's a couple of ways to do it but then they will sit in a, the linux container on your chromebook which is in local memory so it's worth noting if you ever want to power wash the machine you will need to back up those files You've also got things like master PDF, which enables you to modify and encrypt one uh, PDFs. Audacity, which we've probably all used in our iMedia or ICT days, but that installs really nicely onto a Chromebook. Inkscape is your kind of um, Adobe Illustrator alternative, which is really powerful again. And Kden Live um, for video editing. And if you want your students, um, for whatever reason, to experience a locally based uh, office software, then LibreOffice um, has all of their bits and that they will download onto this Linux uh, section of your Chromebook. Um, it's worth noting though that KDEN Live, whilst it is a powerful video tool, um, we're using WeVideo, WeVideo.com, which is an exceptional video editing tool, which is based entirely in the cloud. You can sign in with Google. It's really, really powerful. And we, we kind of do everything um, on that now. Um, and also GIMP, I would tend to use PhotoP and Inkscape. We use something called Canva.com. Again, it's an exceptional online um, Google sign-in package for creating vector illustrations, graphics, posters, um, all kinds of things on there. It's, it's really worth looking up if you haven't done so already. Um, for those six formers that have Chromebooks, we well, we operate a bring your own device um, system in the sixth form anyway, but a lot of the students bring in Chromebooks, they like them, um, they find them easy to use. And so what we, re we recommend for them is VS Code. VS Code um, is a great IDE, supports Python and a few other languages. Um, and all you need to do with that is download the .deb file, right click on it and say open with Linux and that will install for you. You still need to um, make sure you've got a Python interpreter um, on there. But you can do that by using everyone's favorite IDE really and, and that's idle. Um, idle installs with just one line um, in the terminal. And what I found about being a novice Linux user um, a couple of years ago is that when you follow tutorials, it tends to just work. Um, I've not had any issues with anything that I've installed. Um, but even if I have, obviously, the support um, and tutorials online is phenomenal. But you can just um, type in sudo app get install idle 3, and then you'll have idle on your um, Chromebook. I use um, Pygame. Um, so you can install that. You'll need to install something called pip first. Again, there's loads of tutorials out there. What I've got at the top here is my current um, Chromebook, and you'll notice that I'm actually using PyCharm, slightly more tricky to install, but does run on Linux, um, and I use that over VS Code. And I've also got um, Cisco's Packet Tracer on there, which again works on the Linux app side um, of the Chromebook. Cloud-based apps, though, are going to be what the majority of schools who don't have a one-to-one -one, um, Chromebook option and have classes where they have um, just Chromebooks, which is what we mainly do for Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. We've just um, removed our last desktop um, computer suite, so we have one which is just all Chromebooks. It's all fully mobile. And so we would use web-based apps. For Key Stage 3, there's no surprise that Scratch is there. Um, 
in a bit, I will talk about machine learning for um, students which uses Scratch. And actually, we find that most students are, are quite well versed and a little bit bored, perhaps, of creating regular games in Scratch. So that's a nice option um, for year seven and eight. Also, you've got a really nice extension for Chrome called Co Coding with Chrome. And that gives you two options. There's a beginner option, which is with Blockly or an advanced option, which is Python. And I think it also does um, JavaScript. I haven't used it for um, a while. Also on this side here for Key Stage 4, really, um, and Key Stage 5, we use REPL. REPL's fantastic because it's got support for Pygame and TK Inter, so students can create a full-blown game or project using a, a GUI really easily and all online. And actually, last year, um, at least four of my students completed the whole of their sixth form or um, A-level NEA on REPL and didn't bother you know, the idea was they were going to put upload code just to make it easy coming in and out of school. And in the end, they just used REPL because it was so easy. At the bottom here, we've got Google Colab, which I'm going to talk about in more detail because that is it's relatively new um, and it's exceptionally good. This is just um, showing you on this left hand side here that all of these things are easy to do in REPL. So you can see that we've got some object oriented um, tasks in there. We've got um, queues and stacks. It supports SQL Lite. Over here, we've got um, what Colab looks like. And as you can see, um, you can write and save to files using Google Colab. You can use SQL Lite. Um, it doesn't support anything like TK, Inter, or Pygame. However, I did want to talk through it a little bit because it looks like it's shaping up to be a really good option um, to replace REPL for Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. And, and that is because REPL is moving to a paid for environment. So you, you can still use REPL, you can still share REPLs with your students, but the classroom facilities have them all in one um, spot is being depreciated and it will move to a, a paid for platform. So Google Colab allows you to have it inside Google Classroom. So it's free. Basically, it's Python that w runs in the web browser, but how you can do it, if I just show you a larger screenshot, is you're able to just add text so you can give your students instructions and you're able to um, just add code. Now, when you're adding code, all of these snippets of code will just run inside the, the browser window. So if students get exercises to do, they can work on them, they submit them via classroom, and then when I'm marking, I can just click play. And this has extra file support, you can copy it straight to Drive. And it's worth noting that if you um, write a function up here, you can still use it in these snippets down here, this all links together in one collab file. So what you've got here, you can see that I've done some exercises for um, the string data type. I've made one collab file where I've put instructions. Um, we, at the moment, are using the Craig and Dave time resources, which follow along really with a prim methodology. So students are asked to predict uh, what the code does and then run it and then investigate that a little bit, modify it, and then make their own code. And that works really well with Colab because you can start with small exercises and then at the end just say, you know, program this, 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 and this. Um, and then here, just, you know, I have one, I send it out to um, all of my students like I would any assignment in Classroom. And then I've got them all here contained in my, in my Google Classroom. It's really quite uh, exceptional. It does have some caveats. They say that they can't always guarantee that the resources will be there. Now, I've never had a problem. Um, I've got a class of 20 odd GCSE students all running it and, and we've not yet experienced any problems with it. Um, so that's that's programming um, or some ways that you might find success of um, teaching programming on a Chromebook. And before we finish, I just wanted to talk through the Key Stage 3 curriculum and the general Key Stage 4 curriculum, um, national curriculum, what students are expected to do, and just a few further resources that you might have um, in order to do that. So abstractions that model um, behavior of real world problems well we can do most of that in sheets and actually having spreadsheet ability should not have disappeared with it in in my opinion so we've got google sheets we also have um 
interesting in the key stage three curriculum, this the idea of having two languages. And this is where machine learning for kids comes in. So this is all based on scratch, but it's actually machine learning. So it's a really interesting um, element to incorporate. So they are all lessons. They've all been written for you. It's a really exceptional resource. I recommend that one. And also, if you're looking for something a bit different, Google for Education is Applied Digital Skills. If you search for AppScript, these will give you some nice little lessons um, on how to use the, the app script that comes with um, Google, which is obviously their kind of equivalent of VBA, which will count as another language. Um, we follow roughly the OCR schemes of work for Key Stage 4, but we are implementing more and more of the NCC schemes of work because I think they're just really good. Year 10s have been engaging really well with them. And then I just wanted to show you logic.ly, which is for logic diagrams. Now, the free version, you can't save, but all I've done is set them all up and snip them out using my snipping tool and use them. So in conclusion, really, there isn't any point on the National Curriculum for Computer Science that you can't teach with the Chromebook. And if you would like any further information on any of this, then please do fill out the... Um, PID form that was sent to you and then I will be in touch. Everything that we've talked about in this webinar will be sent out um, over the next week and will be available um, on our EdTech Demonstrator site which is at this web address. Thank you, thank you for taking the time today.